Good morning. Um, will you t turn with me to Matthew chapter 6? And we'll be reading verses um, 5 down to 15. Matthew 6, verses 5 to 15. Reading from the NIV, the New, New International Version. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us th today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Here endeth the reading of our text for today. And Father, we look to you, the author of the word, and we pray that you will minister your word to our hearts. Open our hearts, open our minds, so we may be conscious of all the Spirit wants to say to us through your word. And by this may Christ be glorified and people respond to what you have to say to them today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Despite this being the first Sunday in Advent. And Advent brings in the time of waiting, which is what Advent is. You're waiting on an event. You're waiting on the coming of God. But I was prompted to make a contribution to the study on prayer. So forgive me if I am not sounding very much in the season as, we, as in the sermon today. Um, <clears throat> at least I'm glad that um, we have had two songs that would have sort of set a bit of the tone for the season. But I've been listening to our Bible studies on Wednesday night on the topic of prayer, and I trust that many of you are as well. And I've heard 
discussions on things like the format of prayer, whether it should be what's more significant, whether it is private or corporate. We have heard the review of Paul's prayer for the Philippians. And while this has been going on, one thing that sort of came across my mind I was prompted to think about was about our attitude in prayer. And this may be short-circuiting where our pastor will go in the Bible studies, I don't know, but since I felt this inclination, I thought I would just grasp hold of it at this occasion. And that's why my topic, since I'm thinking of our attitude in prayer, my topic is proper preparation for prayer. Proper preparation for prayer. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that the clock is no longer in front of me over there. And I'm probably going to be struggling to get this done in a decent time frame. I preached at a church last Sunday and in the first of their two services, after a while someone sat there and would flash up for me to say, you have 15, 15 minutes to go. And then afterwards the next flash up was five minutes to go. So I, that. <laughs> but what I wanted us to think about is this, that it's intriguing that if you think of Jesus' discussion on the topic of prayer, one of the things that he seemed to make as a precondition for prayer is forgiveness. And if this ends up being so consistent and so repeated by Jesus, yet is something I find that we do not take seriously enough. We will repeat it when we repeat the Lord's Prayer, you know, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Yet, in that presentation of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus went twice later on, he goes on to elaborate just on that clause. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then at other times, you'll read Jesus teaching specifically on this matter. If you don't forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. And so, <clears throat> when I was musing on this fact of why Jesus seemed to make forgiveness a precondition in prayer... One of the things that came to me is that prayer includes petitioning God on behalf of others. Usually that's referred to by the term intercession. You're praying on behalf of others. And therefore, if we are doing that for a proper petitioning of others, we need a proper perspective on certain things. You need a proper perspective of others. If you're going to be praying for others, you have to start by having a proper perspective of them. Do you really value others? How can you pray for them unless you value them? A proper perspective on others. You need a proper perspective on ourselves. Are we free from any burdens inflicted by others? We can't pray if those burdens are still being carried. Are we liberated and free enough to liberate others? So we have a perspective on others, we have to have a perspective on ourselves, and we have to have a perspective on our Lord. Are we cooperating with God in the healing, liberating, and the reconciling ministry? That's all encompassed in this idea of when he said, before you pray, forgive. Start there. 
Wipe the tape, wipe the slate clean regarding your relationship to others. So I have about, what, five, probably six points, which I probably will not get through most of them. But one of the things, one of the points I start with to get in your minds, this first one, wounds occur along the way. Wounds occur along the way. You will both incur them or you will inflict them. I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but tell, I would love to ask anybody here who has never incurred a wound. Never been wounded. Wounds are part of the journey in relationships. These wounds occur by deeds, acts of injustice. It may not be that you were discriminated against. It could be that in school you were wrong, incorrectly blamed for something. You got wounded by that. You're wounded by abuse. The very parent you have may have abused you because they, the way in which they punished you. These things happen. But think of the abuse. This is why people keep on bringing out placards in these situations and say, we want justice. They feel the wounds whether we agree with them or not, but they feel the wounds of injustice. What about the wounds that are caused by war? And you're one of the features in these modern times, whereas, you know, I remember when uh, the things like the Vietnam War was going on, and you, rarely, you hear about it, you read about it, but you never got much visibility of it. Now, it's brought vividly to our minds by our television screens, the suffering caused by war. And some of it I find hard even to watch. I'll never forget the picture of this little Palestinian boy who, when there was a bomb around him and he said, I didn't do anything. Man, that tore my heart. Parents gone, everything. I didn't do anything. And you find a wound that has been there. The shrapnel of war. Sometimes the wounds come, may not be by acts of injustice or deeds of abuse, but by words spoken, whether uttered maliciously or not. I'm looking at an audience today and many of you will have to could admit to me that you are living with wounds inflicted by words many years ago. A teacher that said you will not amount to anything. Someone says, someone here sitting where they say you're going to be worthless like your daddy. You look like him and you're going to be like him. Wounds. And these things go in the minds and the hearts of a young person. And you will be looking at me in your 60s. And the wounds are still there. Never get rid of it. I don't want to spend, spend too long about it. But when we think of these wounds, the fact I said before, we incur them and we inflict them. When you think about wounds as words, man, if I would get a dollar for every careless word I've spoken that may have hurt people, I would be a rich man. Because maybe did not meaning anything, but it, it lasts somebody in a way that hurt them. And if you think then that 
Boy, <laughs> Mike, you're really bad. If you're saying that, <laughs> you mess up so many people by the words you speak. You know what James said? James 3 verse 2, that we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. And he's able to bridle his whole body. Because our words mess up people. And we have to be so careful with what we utter. We hurt, we inflict wounds and we incur wounds because of words. But the second point, main point, not only that wounds occur along the way, but wounds are painful and personal. You know, it's a lie what they told us when we were kids or what we tried to say. I see everybody knows that one. That sticks and stones will break my bones, but words can't hurt me. It's a lie. It's a defensive mechanism that we try to use to protect ourselves. You're never too mature to avoid the pains of wounds. Never too mature. It happened when you were young, now you're an old person, and people will say words that burn you right up to now. You're going, you can't wipe it out because you're too old. Hmm. And you're never too spiritual to prevent them occurring. Rather than elaborating on that, I'll just give you an, exp a, 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 an experience or an illustration of this. I remember the pastor I worked with and assisted for many years in Bermuda. I know what it is for him to call me, Mike, and he called me and he would be weeping. The man that has dedicated so much of his life to ministry. But he would be weeping and say, Mike, you hear what they're saying about me? You know how long I've been working with that person in the church? You know what they said about me? And they would have wounded him by a slander. <laughs> tore him so much that it drove him to tears and he was not shy of crying about it. Wounds are painful. And I know in a particular situation, in fact, more than once this has happened, that many months later on, he'd say, Mike, guess who is in the hospital? And it looks like I'm the first person they've called. That I have to be there Get out of my bed to go minister to the same person who wounded me. Later, later on, I may have to be burying that person. That's the life of pastoring. You have to excuse those wounds so you can minister to them. And I tell you something, it is not easy. The very person who stabs you in the back have to be able to walk past the wound and deal with them in love. And the closer the relationship you have is the more painful the wound. Uh, if, if you want a script, script a passage to back that up, when Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, in Philippians chapter 1 verse 17, he was speaking, he said, he said to, in that letter, the former, and he was speaking of those who were preaching out of rivalry and envy. He's now in prison. And he said, I am in prison. And some people are preachers, so they are fellow preachers. They are proclaiming Christ out of rivalry and envy. But they proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me. 
by my imprisonment. The man was already locked up and they are using that and they are preaching Christ but doing it in such a way that it would hurt Paul. See, you're never too spiritual. That is the apostle speaking about it. And if you ever want to read what he wrote like in 2 Timothy in his pastoral passage, um, letter to Timothy, you will see he called names every now and then. Alexander the coppersmith, this one. And you just name people and say, they hurt me. You're never too big for it. Never too spiritual to avoid it. There's a passage that fascinated me when I was, when I was preparing this. In, in Ze Zechariah 13 verse 6. And many think that this is a messianic reference. But what it says in Zechariah 13 verse 6. And one shall say unto him. Where are the wounds in, where, what are those wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. You go to your friend's house and they are the ones who wound you. Why they think it's messianic? Because Jesus said, when Judas betrayed him, have you when they came to him for the gar in the garden of Gethsemane, have you come, my friend, betrayed by those closest to you? I know the idea of a personal, let me give you just a personal part of this story. Recently, we were with our children, who are adults really, and, uh, and these are children we love dearly. I remember once being with one of them and I said, said something to her which I didn't mean in any malicious way. But obviously what I said triggered her. Triggered her in such a way that she knows that she's, I'm in my 40s, you're treating me like a child. But she responded with all guns blazing. And when I thought of doing this, I said, should I go there or not? But I realized in the sermon, I have to be transparent enough because some of you sitting here know exactly what this is like. All guns blazing. And it was terrible. Don't know if I got in a good shot or not. But let me tell you something. I was wounded. Wounded real bad. And I remember because when we parted and it was, I said, my God, is this way we're parting? I remember that night, I couldn't sleep. I was there sobbing, couldn't sleep. And I said, maybe I haven't suffered enough of these type of wounds in life, but it is hot. And it hurt. By the grace of God, by the next day, the text messages were coming, apologizing. And then God orchestrated, so we got together again. Apologize. Learning how to express our feelings. And we there hugged and cried again. Because there was reconciliation. But all I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not to focus on the details. I wanted to get to the point. That in life you're going to incur some wounds that's going to hurt you. And they're going to be personal. And they're going to be painful. And you wonder if you will get past it. And you know what is a natural response to wounds? Retaliation. Revenge. Self-vindication. And if you have not experienced those inner feelings 
where you said, I don't have to be treated like that. You want to lash back. But let me tell you, a good example of this is our, that fascinated me and keep resonating with me. I'll never forget when the Hamas war with Israel began. And they, were, they interviewed President Biden at a certain time. And he was saying, you know, there's, that Israel is justified in their response and all that sort of thing. But one thing he said, as I said, resonated with me. He said, I have warned them to be careful with their response. Don't make the mistake that United States did after 9-11. And I said, wow. You know what that means? He's, what he was pointing to, after 9-11, the United States was seeking for revenge. As a result of seeking for revenge, looking back of the, they would never have seen that it meant 20 years fighting a war in Afghanistan, spending over $20 trillion and losing 2,000 soldiers. And having 20,000 wounded. Why? Going for revenge. And not only that, the revenge never ends the situation. As a result of their actions, it began, it fostered ISIS. Because the more you hurt people, is the more they're going to, rather, they're going to take an option of trying to come back to hurt you again. And it may not be the way you like it. So, you think I'm just speaking of war in the Middle East. Bring it right on home. One of the major costs, causes of our murder rate in Jamaica is reprisal killing. Reprisal. And we may sit in our living rooms and in our homes and feeling secure and think everything is all right. What do you think happens in the mind of a child when a gang member somewhere else comes and takes out their father? Or sometimes a policeman comes and that child now lives with a wound growing up and all they are thinking about, I'm going to get to a stage where I'm going to take revenge. And that circle continues on and on and on. When will it stop? Who will break the circle? It takes God to get in a heart and bring forgiveness and say it ends now. And you may think I'm just speaking about gang warfare in Jamaica. It happens in families and some of you know it. Because of not forgiveness, unforgiveness, that's what can happen. That's why forgiveness is so important. Third point, forgiveness is required then for wound healing. Forgiveness is required for wound healing. Wounds are painful and personal, but forgiveness is required for wound healing. If we don't forgive, wounds fester and become more deadly till it infects the whole body. It becomes toxic and very dangerous. If there is no forgiveness, wounds fester. When we don't forgive, we imprison ourselves to thoughts that give others control over us. <laughs> That's a very subtle point. When you see people, and as you see them, something riles up in you, it means that person has control over you. When you come around people, 
and anger comes around you, you realize that you are no different from that person having a remote control over you and just said, get you upset. Triggers you. And you know what that's like? Because you have not forgiven, you can't sit at peace with them and they come and end up triggering you. You imprison yourself. Forgiveness, therefore, helps you to come out of prison. You unlock your own prison door by, unforg by forgiveness. You said, I won't let you control me anymore. I'll wipe the slate so I can come out of here. Not only that, what unforgiveness does, it puts you over to the tormentors. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on that, on that but just when you learned, heard the lesson that was read before from Matthew chapter 18 when the servant would not forgive like he was forgiven by his Lord, the, the, the Lord said, you are a wicked man. And as a result of you, I'm going to hang, I'm going to put you over to the tormentors until you pay back everything. And anybody who lives in unforgiveness right now, right here, you're living in a state of torment. And as Proverbs, as Solomon says in the Proverbs, a hum, human spirit can endure sickness. But a crush or a wounded spirit, who can bear it? So when we have unforgiveness, it leads us to praying wrongly. As James referred to it, praying amiss. If you don't have, if you didn't start with the forgiveness, then your prayers will be wrong. And if you, you'll pray the wrong type of prayers. You want an example of that? If you read through the Psalms, you'll see some of David's prayers. And some of it will make your skin crawl. Oh my God, he never really said that. <laughs> when David was praying for enemies, you want, you, want, you want me to repeat one, for example, in Psalm 69, David praying to God about an enemy said, Let their own table before them become a snare. And when they are at peace, Lord, let it be a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him who you have struck, whom you have struck down and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let, their may they may let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be en enrolled among the righteous. Wow, David. Lord, David. That's harsh. And that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's not the, the high-grade one. <laughs> you have someone who said, Lord, let their children be trampled upon. Let them die. Oh, my God, David. Come on, David. As the, what forgiveness does, and this is the Christian response. It may not sound something that Israel would take or anything like that, but the Christian response said, it fulfilled God's command. Love your enemies. He said, pray for them that persecute you so that you may be the sons of your father in heaven. He causes sons to, son to rise on the just and the unjust. As Paul said, do not avenge yourself. Give place to wrath. Trust God with the person who hurts you. Leave them to God because he had said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. If he needs clothes, go. You be the first one to go clothe them. That's what you do for your enemy. That's the Christian response. Fourthly, by forgiveness, we contribute to the divine process. Because God wants to forgive. And God does that part internally. But there's an external part. 
And the external part is they need to hear the word from the person who would have them up saying, you are free. I don't hold it against you. And what you have done is join externally or naturally with what God is doing internally. Only God can heal internal wounds. But you can work and cooperate with God by relieving the debt. So, when we offer forgiveness, we are providing a natural demonstration of what God is doing spiritually. Fifth, prayer requires an acknowledgement of the reality of the gospel. Prayer requires an acknowledgement of the reality of the gospel. You will say to me, well, how, how did we end up here? You're talking about wounds and forgiveness and all these things, how we end up here, because that's where the gospel comes in. There's a passage, Luke 23, 33 and 34, and it says, and when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, the criminals and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Herein lies the gospel. What I'm saying that you'll realize that Pilate had earlier on declared Jesus had done no evil, nothing to be guilty of, not deserving of death. He had not wounded anyone. That's one man that walked this earth without, wounded any, without wounding anyone. Yet what he did was hand over Jesus to be wounded and crucified. Now you think of injustice. He was declared guiltless, not wounding anyone, yet he was handed over to be wounded and to be crucified. And when he was done, not only that he was handed over to be wounded and crucified, but crucified between two criminals to say, look here, you're just like one of them. Oh boy. But when that happened, just after Luke wrote to be crucified, and there crucified him, Jesus said, his first words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Who are the they? Who are the them? To whom do these pronouns refer? And Bible scholars debate the fact, was it the Roman authorities that then began the execution? Was it the Jews who handed him up? Was it the crowd that bellowed, crucify him, crucify him? I'm glad that Luke left it very open because the they includes me. And it includes all the people down through the years because all of us were part of who were crucifying Jesus. As Isaiah put it, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him so that by his stripes my wounds can be healed. So Jesus cried, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Notice in said that he, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know, know what they're doing, we were not guiltless. Pause and think of that. 
We handed him over. Our sins was upon him. We were not guiltless, but he declared us innocent. Boy, I, that can preach. We were not guiltless, and he declared us innocent. Saying, they don't know what they're doing. Therefore, it means we were shielded from the wrath of God because Jesus took our guilt upon himself and he took God's wrath in our place and while taking God's wrath, he declared me innocent. My God, my God. What beauty is that? I know I'm guilty, but Jesus said I'm innocent. He took my sin and my sorrow and made them his very own. He took the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. The gospel is not just for our initial salvation. It's not for a declaration to the sinners to come to Jesus. The gospel has to be a part of our daily experience. Amen. It has to be part of it because when we are wounded and we find it difficult to forgive others, we must be brought again to the cross where we were rem are reminded of our guilt before God and the fact that God has declared us innocent and free from wrath for Jesus' sake. And when we are brought to the cross, then we can see how easy it is for it to be somebody else. We were there at a debt that was so high we could not pay. And he took it from us. Can't we therefore deal with the minuscule debt that somebody has for us? That's the gospel. And when I think about the gospel like that, I think, I think of what happened the other day when I was thinking about that. And one song that came to my mind. <laughs> Jesus, keep me near the cross. Keep me near the cross. Because when I stay near the cross, I will see that there is nothing anybody could do to me. That's worth me holding on to it. Because Jesus has released me at the cross. And there is the gospel. Just like it says in, in, in Isaiah, he made intercession for offenders. We end up thanking Jesus for healing our wounds. He did it. Lastly, wounds leave scars. After healing, wounds leave scars after healing. You ever look down at your body sometimes and you can tell a story by the scars? I remember that one in my foot bottom that's when I stand up on a, stood up on a nail one day. I remember that one when I, the, the barbed wire cut me when I was cross climbing over the fence where I should not climb. You know, the, you, you, you go down them and you see all these wounds. Oh, I remember that one when I had a, I had a C section. That, that was for the first one or the second. Your, your scars, you can tell a tale by your scars. That's what wounds do. The scars are memorials of pain that you suffered that have now been healed. And you know one thing, the scars don't cause you to, I don't care how hard you try or how much you embellish it, the scars don't cause you to recollect the depth of the pain you felt then. But it just tells the story of what you went through. That's what scars are. And what it says to you, look at what happened. When Jesus was resurrected and he came up with a resurrected body, he still carried scars. 
Lord, have mercy. He had a resurrected body that he could walk through closed doors. He could disappear from their sight. But yet still, when he appeared before them, he said to Thomas, look at the scar. Resurrection never took away the scar. Why did the scars there? So you can remember what I suffered for you. And so that's when we look to Jesus and we realize that, Lord, those scars tell a story. And I just need sometimes to see from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and woe mingled down. Did ye hear such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? Lord, any time I'm having difficulty forgiving anyone else, show me your hands again. Show me your wounds again. And I remember what I got from you. And I'm saying to you this morning, have you any wounds that you think can never be healed? God can do that. Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. You know, don't gloss over those words. He says, if you have anything against anyone. Say it after me. Anything against anyone. Let's do it again. Anything against anyone. Oh Lord, you're going to say just that little thing that happened you're talking about. Anything. <laughs> the person who abandoned you as a child and it still bothers you. Anything against anyone. The, purse, the school that kicked you out and you say, I would never have walked past that gate again. Anything against anyone. The one who broke your heart when you thought you first found the love of your life and you're still singing, the first cut is the deepest and you realize anything against anyone. Lord, have mercy. The person who manipulated it to take away your inheritance so that you did not get what you thought you should have gotten from those who there and you caused the dead left to keep you in prison. Anything from anyone. The person who in church did not give you any respect, they diss you and never regarded what you did for them. And then they took the accolades afterwards and it hurt you. Anything? You're standing to pray? Are you really prepared to pray? <laughs> if you are prepared for prayer, have a proper perspective about others, about ourselves, and about our Lord. Because failure to forgive shows a lack of trust in the justice of God who promised to take care of what we give up. And it shows a failure to appreciate the mercy that you have received. Let us bow our heads as we meditate on this. The proper preparation for prayer. Father, 
when you become so specific, detailed and intense, it becomes a hard saying. But you are causing the spirit to show us in our minds words like anything from anyone. So Lord, as we come before you, we make a decision now. By the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, cause us to see the cross and realize there is nothing anyone can do us that compares to what you have forgiven us of. Cause us to release it now. Cause us to break through against that imprisonment now. Cause us to hand it over to you now. By your mercy, do a working us as you do, do the work, as you begin to heal wounds, dry tears, and reconcile people to each other by the grace of God. Amen. 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 There may be somebody listening to me this morning who have never been brought to the place where they realize that the cross offers an invitation. Come, give up your care, give up your sorrow, find relief for your burden. I don't have to tell you you're a sinner. I know what it is to be a sinner. But as Paul says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. Chiefest of sinners Jesus will save. If you're here and you never made that commitment to offer yourself to God if you're online, this is a good day to realize that Christ is willing and open to forgive you. Is there one here this morning? You can either indicate it by a raised hand, by standing up, or getting with me or any of the leaders here after service to let us know what the Lord said to you in your heart. And the fact that you can live free from the burden of sin and know the forgiveness that God offers. Don't leave here with the, the backpack loaded down with guilt and shame. Come to the cross and let Jesus deal with it there.